Uh, welcome back to Think Tech here on a given Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and we have the honor of Jerry Cohen, who joins us from New York City to talk about to, to catch up on what's happening in China. Thanks so much for being on the show, Jerry. I'm delighted, Jay. You know, uh, look, looking you up has been an incredible experience to see all the things. I, you know, I knew I knew what you were doing when you were here when I met you ten years ago, maybe fifteen, um, and uh, I know more now. I recall that uh, you know when we last met, I, I said, "Gee, how is it that you can practice for an American law firm in Beijing at the same time uh, teach at NYU?" And your answer was, you probably don't remember, your answer was, yeah, NYU has been asking me the same question. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, I gave that up, so I've been an academic for many years, and uh, I haven't been active in practice except in behalf of human rights victims in China. That's not to say, though, that you were not active in business and trade. As a matter of fact, and we have two photographs of you way back in 1979 at the request of the Chinese government where you went to China, um, you know, just as it was opening up uh, under Deng Xiaoping, I think. And you were and you were teaching uh, Chinese officials about American law, American trade. There's there's one picture uh, and uh, there's another one, too, we have. Um, and uh, quite extraordinary that you did that. And it was a, a tremendous contribution to them. And I wonder if you can talk a little about, um, you know, what the nature of that contribution and how it affected China and the trade and, and the development of law, which they didn't have much of at the time. Um, and, and, of course, what do you think of that contribution now today? Well, of course, today some people are highly critical of the efforts that many of us made in the late 70s and 80s at the request of the People's Republic. Uh, to help them uh, enter the world community and uh, diplomatically, politically, economically, uh, and legally. And uh, China, after three decades of terrible suffering, anti-rightist movement, the Great Leap Forward disaster, the great proletarian cultural revolution, tens of millions of people dying of starvation, terrible political repression, 1979, 30 years after going through all that, the People's Republic under Deng Xiaoping decided to give up class struggle and try to join the world, uh, modernize their economy and their society and their political system. And they needed help. And the legal system was a particular problem for them because it had uh, really been in remission for 20 or more years. And they were even out of touch with the Soviet system that had originally influenced uh, the first eight or nine years of uh, rule under the communists in China. So I was uh, interested in learning about uh, the Chinese legal system up close. I'd started August 15, 1960, at 9 a.m. with my first Chinese lesson. I'd been waiting many years to live in China. We first went there after 12 years of waiting, but uh, for the next uh, six or seven years, I had occasional trips where they were very polite to me, but never would tell me anything because they didn't have anything that they were willing to show because they were very embarrassed about the lack of a legal system. So I was eager to have an opportunity with the new Deng Xiaoping regime to live there. And through my uh, Harvard tutor, who was from Beijing and connected to one of the leading economic officials, uh, I had the opportunity to go there, not just for a week or a month, uh, but for at least a year, perhaps two, to train their business officials. The law schools weren't yet open. Law professors weren't really permitted to meet with me, but the business officials were eager. And anything I told them at 9 o'clock in the morning, they put to use at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 
So it was an extraordinary period. Well, you know, you, you wrote a, uh, a piece, um, a, a memoir, an article, which appeared in your blog. And by the way, for our listeners, uh, Jerry's blog is called Jerry's Blog on Recent Developments in the Rule of Law in China and Asia. It's at JeromeCohen.net. Uh, and uh, I, I should add that the photo there, which is really a, a wonderful photo, is, uh, is by Joan LeBeau Cohen, Jerry's that wife is... for many, many years been through the wars with him. <laughs> yeah, she is sitting here with me and glad to hear that you're giving her credit for her photos. Often people fail to. Re regards to Joan from uh, Sherry Broder, regards to you from Sherry Broder, who well, has helped us connect you. with you this morning. <laughs> well, she's a marvelous person, and uh, we're glad that uh, she continues the work of John Van Dyke, her late husband. Absolutely, absolutely. So this article, this memoir, which uh, the world can see, is on that blog, um, and it, it answers the question. And the, the, you know, the primary question is: Was was it a mistake to teach the Chinese about law and trade? Um, and, and and did you do it the right way? Uh, because if we look at it today, 2020, um, maybe it didn't turn out the way you had hoped. Am I right? Well, uh, it has turned out in many ways uh, the way we had hoped. In uh, 1979, the poverty in China was enormous. Educational system was in shreds. Uh, there was no law to speak of, tremendous insecurity. And uh, we were there uh, not to create democracy. We weren't naive to think we were going to create China in the American image or the Western liberal image. But we thought we could make a better life for people, introduce some notion of legal stability, some notice, uh, some notion of uh, due process of law that we could help China uh, cooperate with the world. The legal system was essential to having successful business cooperation. They needed more trade. They had to start importing foreign technology. And above all, they were short of money. They wanted foreign investment. They had very little foreign exchange. And uh, we helped them do that over a period of years. Uh, it took a lot of effort that the Chinese government was uh, eager. Uh, they weren't worrying about uh, human rights in the sense of uh, uh, protection against arbitrary government, and arbitrary arrest, but they were worried about crime because crime was a serious problem. They wanted a legal system that could help them suppress crime. But above all, they wanted foreign exchange. They needed to know about contracts. They needed to know about how to settle business disputes, uh, what courts should do, and what arbitration institutions should do. Uh, it was very, very basic. Uh, I remember a very smart young man who worked for the Ministry of Machine Building in Shanghai who wanted to go to study law at Harvard. So far at that point, we hadn't yet been able to send anyone, although I was eager to do so. And uh, I said to him, uh, why do you want to study law? And he said, every day we, uh, we at the Ministry of Machine Building are negotiating with the giants of the automotive industry of various countries. He said, now I'm negotiating with Volkswagen. They want to do a joint venture. And we in the law and contract division of our ministry have only one problem. I said, what's that? He said, we don't know anything about law or contracts. <laughs> and he was not only being humorous, but he thought he was being very accurate. So that's where we started. So you had nowhere to go but up. Well, you know, you were the perfect person for this. Uh, you know, you, you've been uh, at, at Yale undergraduate, Yale graduate. At law school, you've been the editor in chief. You were a clerk for not one but two justices in in the Supreme Court. You were a prosecutor. Um, you you understood it on both sides of the coin, both civil and criminal. Um, and and I want to add something else that I have gleaned from what I've seen about you is you really like people. 
that article, for example, the memoirs, is loaded with the people you've dealt with. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, the talks you've given with students and the like, and you're, you're into people, you're into communication. So you were the perfect guy uh, to talk with them and to, uh, you know, disarm them somehow and, and uh, make, them, make them more sophisticated in the area of law and trade. And therefore, I put you at the center of a movement in China uh, that ultimately resulted in enormous trade between China, the U.S., and other countries. You gave them the tools to do that. Am I right? Well, I certainly helped, but uh, many people helped. And of course, the Chinese did most of the work. I met so many able people, so many people hungry for learning who wanted to play a useful role in helping their country, who wanted to learn something about the world. Uh, it was a gratifying uh, experience, and it continues to be, despite the restraints of the Xi Jinping regime. Uh, we still have some research and training exchange projects going in China, even though the obstacles are greater than they were a decade ago. And we still have some contacts with Chinese scholars, Chinese lawyers, even some judges and prosecutors. Uh, but everybody is operating under strict limits. And yet China is subject not only to internal pressures from all these people who really want to bring the rule of law to China, but to a lot of external pressures. And uh, we just had news today of a lawyer, human rights expert, who was locked up for five years and was released on uh, April 5th. And, they, and China doesn't like to free people from prison, but when they free them, they don't like them to be free afterward and be free to talk and tell what happened to them in prison and why. So this time, because of a lot of media pressure, uh, the man today, we learn, was allowed to reunite with his family after temporarily being held for two weeks on the excuse that he had to undergo quarantine because he might have the coronavirus. That wouldn't have happened without foreign protests, and I and others wrote about it. And uh, occasionally we get some victories even now, however slow they are in coming. But it's you much helped tougher. a lot of people over the years. You've helped a lot of people, dissidents and the like, who have been the object of uh, detention or worse. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that's probably that kind of uh, detention or worse. Uh, I'm thinking of letters from Masanjia, the movie a, a couple of years ago about a fellow who was in the Falun Gong and wound up in a detention situation, which was actually torture for, I don't know, three or four years. Um, I'm thinking that that's the part. Um, that is a disappointment, uh, because you had hoped to achieve, to impart a, a level of uh, human rights uh, to China back in, in the 70s, and that really hasn't happened. And as you suggest, it, it may be on the decline right now, uh, which is really regrettable. And I'm sure, you know, you've been active and they know it. And I, I have one big question. Can you go back, Jerry? Can you go back without recrimination of some kind from the government? Uh, I can go back for certain conferences, like about the law of the sea, uh, that the government wants to sponsor. Uh, I haven't been eager to go back for the last year and a half or so. Uh, I have met with Chinese human rights delegations as well as law of the sea delegations here. I don't know. I, I had the optimism about three years ago to apply for a 10-year visa, which at my age really was optimistic. But whether they would honor it today, despite having issued it three years ago, it's hard to say because I've become increasingly identified as a human rights advocate who opposes what the PRC regime under Xi Jinping has been doing. And yet, I hear from Chinese officials and judges regularly, and many of them still want to know what we think of what they're doing, and they still want the opportunity to come to this country. And unfortunately, the Trump administration is making it more difficult 
for our Chinese experts in many fields to come here. So we're facing obstacles on both sides of the water. Yeah, um, I I um, I just uh, I saw one thing. Um, yeah, this is this is uh, in your article, and if you don't mind, I'd like to just look at it with you um, about optimism. For example, in, in the year two thousand and eight, when you spoke at Cal Western, the Earl Warren uh, program, the Earl Warren School of Law program, there you were fa- you were fairly optimistic about the future. It's uh, what is it twelve years later now, and. Um, you know, have to be realistic. But this is what you wrote in your article. Spurred by the informed reaction of citizens determined to allow their suppressed fury to overcome their fear, there will be another top-down attempt to improve human rights protection, permit civil society to recover from Shi-era persecutions, and free the country to become less censored and manipulated. When that day dawns, the sustained American and other foreign law reform cooperation that persists even now in China may be highly appreciated and useful to further progress, as it proved to be in newly democratic Taiwan and South Korea. To me, that is the port parole. Um, that is the statement of the future. Would you? What would you say about that? What would you add to that? Well, you know, development in the People's Republic has proceeded like a pendulum uh, in the 2003 five, six era, uh, it looked like law reform was really going to move ahead. Uh, but politics takes command. And uh, since then, we've seen increasingly hostile atmosphere in China toward freedoms of expression and due process of law. But there will be a reaction. You know, uh, I uh, comfortably at Harvard, not in China, lived through the Cultural Revolution. And I put out my first book in 1968 on criminal justice in China, such such as it was. That was the height of the abuses of the Cultural Revolution. But I said, this won't last. Chairman Mao will pass from the scene. There will be a reaction against all the abuses because the Chinese people do not want to live uh, in such horrible circumstances. And of course, that's what the Deng Xiaoping government was. It was a big Mm -hmm. reaction to all the hardship. And the 80s, with some still repressive incidents, the 80s were a pretty good time for law reform in China. And there was optimism then until the tragedy of uh, Tiananmen uh, Square uh, massacre, June 4th, 1989. Uh, But so much in politics in China as elsewhere turns on chance. Uh, There were party leaders in 1987, 1989, just before June 4th, who were more liberal, who were more enlightened. It doesn't mean they were going to be democratic people but they did appreciate more than the successors, the importance of a legal system, if only for recruiting uh, the loyalty of the citizens and making a better life for them. And if politics had gone the other way, uh, you might have had a much more enlightened party leadership uh, in the 90s. But even then you had a very good uh, prime minister named Jerome G. come on in the 90s, if he had been able to get to the top spot. I knew him and I knew he saw the importance of a legal system and the importance of winning foreign support. If he had been able to become the top man, he would have had quite a bit of uh, difference in what's happened. We don't know uh, about Xi Jinping. He was, uh, to many people, a surprise, but not to all. Some have thought, as they do every time there's a new leader in China, maybe things will get more liberal. But now he has imposed such a harsh re- regime that there will definitely be a reaction. And uh, just if we look today at the mystery of what's happened to Kim Jong-un, the uh, dictator of North Korea, one-man management, People in North Korea wouldn't know what to do if it turns out that some of these rumors about him are true. 
I don't know if you've seen that uh, movie called The Death of Stalin, but it's uh, supposed to be a semi-comedy, but I think anybody in China who sees it would have to worry because it shows when the great dictator who makes all the decisions suddenly goes, uh, there's a very difficult situation and there is a reaction. That's what Khrushchev and de-Stalinization was. So in these co countries, progress goes and you might say you know, one step forward, two backward, and then maybe two <laughs> forward and one backward. <laughs> so we have to, uh, China is a huge place. It doesn't respond as quickly as uh, islands like Japan and Taiwan or peninsulas like Korea, South Korea. Uh, the two, the two policies are also in foreign policy though. And uh, we should talk about that for a minute. Uh, we should talk about what's happening with Hong Kong and Taiwan. We should talk about what's happening with uh, the, the, the Belt and Road. We should talk about, uh, what did the New York Times call it? Uh, uh, actually, one of the people reporting to the New York Times called it uh, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, that means taking advantage of the coronavirus. It means being brutal with uh, autonomy in Hong Kong. And you've written a couple of uh, blog pieces about that. Can you, talk, can you talk about what's happening in Hong Kong and what will happen in Hong Kong prior to the end of the take, the end of autonomy in 2047? Hong Kong is the battleground. Uh, it's a shame that Hong Kong, uh, the forces of democracy and human rights and liberty, are fighting a rear guard action. Uh, even if they were to prove successful, which they're not doing at the moment, against the repression that's increasing from Beijing, uh, what happens in 2047? When the 50-year period that Deng Xiaoping agreed to, to allow Hong Kong to retain a high degree of autonomy and retain the legal system of the colonial British uh, government, that could end. No one knows what will happen then, but based on what is happening, one can't be uh, very optimistic about 2047, even if things should improve today in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is different from Taiwan. Taiwan is factually on its own. It's a self-governing place. And although Beijing claims that uh, Taiwan is part of Chinese territory, uh, Taiwan runs its own show and under our umbrella continues to do so despite enormous pressures. And they've made a fantastic transformation over the last generation from the Chiang Kai-shek nationalist Kuomintang dictatorship that we first saw when we went there in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to a very impressive uh, democratic state that shows it's nonsense to say Chinese people are incapable of running a democratic uh, society. That's one of the reasons Beijing is so desperate to get Hong Kong, uh, not, uh, not only get Hong Kong back, but also Taiwan. But Taiwan is a much more uh, difficult challenge for them. Hong Kong is PRC territory. And although uh, the British tried to construct through the treaty they made in 1984 with China over Hong Kong's future, a legal system that would guarantee autonomy at least for 50 years. Uh, it hasn't been working out that way because Beijing is saying those legal guarantees uh, are granted, they're gifts of the central government, that uh, this is not a federal system, China's a unitary system. And uh, although you have a basic law implementing the joint declaration between the UK and the PRC, that that basic law is really to be interpreted at Beijing's will. And in the end, the people of Hong Kong have to knuckle under, and that's what the struggle is all about now. Hong yeah. Kong has yeah. many able lawyers. Hong Kong has many courageous human rights people. And the majority of people seem to be eager 
to have more democracy, not less. And until the virus came, the coronavirus, they were willing to go into the streets even in extraordinary numbers the way they never had done before in order to protest increasing Beijing controls. You know, uh, in 1983, when the draft of the uh, agreement between the UK and the PRC came out, I was working in Hong Kong and uh, an editor of the South China Morning Post came to interview me. And he said, now that we're going to have the joint declaration, he said, the future of Hong Kong is solved. It's clear what's going to happen. And I said to him, are you serious? I said, uh, now the struggle is just beginning because these are just beginning. vague words on a printed page. And the question is, who is going to control their meaning? Who is going to interpret these words and apply them? And that really is what's been going on because we've seen a continuing intensive struggle over the meaning of words, even this week. Well, what does it mean? when Article 22 of the basic law says that no department of the central government shall interfere in affairs that are within the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. And what we've seen is increasing interference on the part of departments of the uh, Beijing government that are stationed in Hong Kong. And they say, well, we're not really a department of the government, we're just the government. They say, we're not interfering, we're just commenting on how bad things are going at Hong Kong. And they say, <laughs> the, uh, they say these aren't matters within the jurisdiction exclusively of uh, Hong Kong because they affect the way China operates. So they're making the determination of what these words mean, sometimes yeah. standing them on their head. But they have the control. It's their bat and ball. And they've got the military in Hong Kong. So my heart goes out to these people in Hong Kong. It's a well, they had an election struggle. in September. And, yes. and, and, and coronavirus has a way of suppressing voting, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we're hoping uh, that even though the virus seems to be extending its reach uh, over time, uh, we're hoping that the election will be held. Uh, however, there's a threat that uh, Beijing could call off the election for one excuse or another. They had uh, district elections, as you know, uh, just a few months ago. And to their embarrassment, the Democratic forces won almost all the seats that were open. This was a terrible shock to Beijing. They've since decided to be much tougher. They've sent in tougher personnel uh, to cope with the situation. And uh, I think they're afraid if there is a free uh, election for the legislature in September, that it will be a terrible repudiation of Beijing's mm -hmm. control of Hong Kong. So they may not let the election take place. Mm -hmm. Now, Jerry, one last thing before we go, and that is uh, American foreign policy to China. We've seen uh, tariffs galore. Uh, we've seen a, a very strange uh, off-again, on-again kind of relationship um, between uh, Donald Trump and Xi Jinping. Um, you know, what would you advise the United States to do at this point uh, to preserve, uh, you know, the enlightenment we had before, uh, or semi-enlightenment, as the case may be, uh, what would you advise the United States to do to avoid, um, you know, having real contention or worse with China? I think we have to work harder toward cooperation. Uh, there are certain fields, not just business, trade, investment, technology, transfer, but more important, climate, environment. These are life-threatening, civilization-threatening dangers and without U.S.-China cooperation, things are going to get worse. So we need cooperation. At the same time, we should have healthy competition uh, in business the way we have competition, uh, even with allied countries and their businesses. So competition is good. Without competition, I think business withers and the public suffers. At the same time, we have to keep up criticism 
And I'm, a, you know, I spend a lot of time on criticism while still supporting cooperation. And it's not easy. But we've got to have continuing public criticism. And that's why I welcome the opportunity you give uh, to people, Mike Davis and others, and Carol Peterson and others, to talk about uh, what the real situation is in Hong Kong and China and elsewhere. Finally, besides criticism, uh, you might say the fourth C, because they're all C, uh, is containment. I do think we need to continue to have a foreign policy that does not let our defenses drop, uh, that does not weaken and we shouldn't be aggressive, but we have to maintain our military capacity in order to continue to get respect from Beijing. So you might say it's the four C's, and I don't mean S-E-A-S -E either. I mean four letter C's, uh, because we need cooperation. Uh, we need uh, competition. We need criticism, uh, and we need containment. So it's a balance. It's not easy. And with the kind of government we have in Washington, it's, uh, they're not capable of maintaining any steady policy toward China. Yeah, well, it'd be nice to see uh, ch a change of the guard in both places, both places more enlightened, both places taking that advice. Jerry Cohn is professor at NYU School of Law, director of its U.S. Asia Law Institute. He's also an adjunct, se uh, adjunct senior fellow for Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he writes this blog. We can all go see it. Uh, it's JeromeCohn.net. And uh, so many very interesting articles and pieces on there on an ongoing basis. Thank you so much, Jerry. I hope we can do this again soon. Jay, you're very kind. I appreciate it. Thanks. Aloha.